Welcome to Embedded FM, the show for people who love building gadgets. I'm Alicia White, here with Christopher White, and we're going to talk to Clive Turvey about ARM cores and ST forums. Hi, Clive. Thanks for joining us today. Hi there. Could you tell us a little about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I'm an English electronics engineer. I you know, emigrated to the U.S. when I was 22 and uh, currently work in the field of uh, Internet of Things, uh, cellular and short-range wireless devices and, and those kind of things. And uh, well, this, some of the things that I run into a lot recently is uh, the kind of migration of legacy phone gear. Uh, everyone's getting rid of uh, copper wires and so tend to work a lot in that space, trying to migrate people from that to kind of cellular networks. But one of the things you are internet famous for is being the person who answers the questions on the ST forums. The only person? (laughs) Well, actually, he's got tags that say, waiting for Clive one, because people only really want answers from him. Yeah, I'm not. That, that, that's kind of creepy sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm him, and uh, I do answer a lot of questions there. And uh, there's probably about like half a dozen of us, I think, that kind of regularly participate and kind of try and try and field some of the questions. Uh, kind of happened into it. Uh, I. I Worked on forums for, for many years, probably going back to the, the, the old CompuServe days and uh, worked uh, a number of them for many years and uh, kind of got sick of them in some, in some respects. And sometimes you get people there that just kind of make it unpleasant to be there. But uh, I'd worked a lot with the STM32 parts and some of the, the, the prior parts that they had made and uh, kind of happened on there and... Uh, Played around with it a bit when they when they first came out, and uh, it it was just a very homely place to be. There wasn't a lot of uh, kind of participation on ST side, and uh, so it uh, and, and people's questions were kind of left hanging. So I kind of stepped up a little bit and tried to kind of help things along and try to leverage some of the experiences I've had over the years uh, to to kind of solve and troubleshoot people's questions. And so this is very much an unofficial support role. Yes. Is it work for you? I mean, is it part of the business that you're in, or is it more of a hobby? It's more of a hobby. It's a, it's a kind of an idle time thing, kind of a challenge to the mind, let's say. When I'm thinking about other things and trying to ha- how I can solve my problems, I go and look at and see what other people's problems are and see how those map to things that I've played with and experiences I've had and whether I, whether I can solve the problem. So people do crosswords and Sudoku and things like that to kind of in their kind of idle time. And uh, I tend to kind of look at this and, and see, see what I can do. But you answer really detailed questions. I mean, about interrupts and well, there's, there's one here about the, LSM 303 DLHC data ready interrupts for the STM 32 F3 discovery. And, and it's in the data sheet and it says one thing, but the forum poster asks something and you, you just cough up an answer, you know, it has two interrupt pins that can be mapped. And then you say, go read the documentation and you do it gracefully. It doesn't sound like I don't know, a lot of forum posts sound angry and yours sound like, oh, well, here's the basic information you need. Now here's where you should go check the next thing. What are what are the best questions you've got? What are the best answers, most things you're most proud of answering? I don't know. I, I go back and look at things over the years and I, I'm kind of impressed sometimes with some of the, the answers they come up with. But I basically leverage kind of all the experience I've gotten over the years. And a lot of these STM32 parts, they're, they're, they're different, but there's, there's more of them that are the same than anything else. And 
I guess I've mellowed over the years. I, I might have said, read the manual years and years ago and the RTFM response, but generally I find that's not very helpful. And people, I think, I grew up at a time when a lot of the technology was just evolving and, and basically all you had was manuals. So you, you learn to be pretty good at reading them and kind of skimming through them and kind of extracting the, the, the pertinent uh, information. And today I suspect that, yeah, some people are lazy, but on the other hand, I think they're overwhelmed with just the volume of the information. It's like, where do I start? Where do I find where these things are? I've always looked through lots of books and I have quite an extensive library and tend to skim things so I know where the information is, which it tends to be more important sometimes than exactly what the information is. It's like, where is this information? How does it correlate with other information that I have? So telling someone to go read the fine manual <laughs> doesn't really, doesn't solve their problem. And so it, it struck me that it would just be a much more helpful if you try to just kind of point them in the right direction. And sometimes I, I try not to be kind of overly verbose with some of the answers. It's just like if, if, if all they need is like, no, you're, you're looking in the wrong place, look over there, is the response. Then that, that's probably the best way to go. I'm thinking about that question you asked. And yeah, there was like a, I think it was one of these uh, accelerometers or something. And I, and, yeah. and I don't think that I've particularly used that part. But it, I've used other parts in similar kind of families. And, yeah, they usually have like a million configurations and a couple of interrupt registers and so forth. And they can be a nightmare to configure. But it's like saying there isn't an interrupt for it. That's not really the answer. So I knew that it had interrupts. And I just kind of Googled the document and thumbed through it briefly. And just it's like, yeah, there's, there's, there's two here and there's definitely pins there and thumb through the registers and yeah, it looks like there's, there's, there's some kind of routing there and I'm not going to solve the problem and write the code because that would take a significant amount of time, but uh, just kind of finding the pertinent information typically doesn't take that long. And some of these, uh, I guess going back to the questions, it's like when you see people, they've said, well, I've been doing this for like three or four days and I'm just kind of getting nowhere. And it's like, those are the kind of, those are the kind of questions I kind of look for. Cause it's like, okay, you, you really should have asked a bit earlier about this, but here, here's, here's where you should look or here's how something should work. And this is what makes sense that should work. It's like, cause some people would say, well, I'm doing this, that, and the other. And you think, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. It's like silicon doesn't function in that fashion. Mm -hmm. You need to kind of step back because it's computers and silicon are often a lot stupider than people think. It's like they do very, very predictable things. And so sometimes you see people that have done this for a while and, and or been thinking about things for a while. And it's like, you know, you're just overthinking this. And so, Try to address those kind of things. Um, I don't know if I necessarily look for particular questions or particular people asking questions. There's, as I say, there's probably about like half a dozen, a dozen people that I recognize on the forum who answer specific types of questions and they have certain specialities. So it's like if I see something that, that's probably better suited to them, I'll let it sit for a while and come back to it. But, um, what you said earlier about, uh, you know, when you first started out learning to read manuals and digest information, uh, kind of goes to a, a joke I often say, or, or something that I often, uh, complain about it in that I can't remember how I used to do things before Google, <laughs> um, at work, you know, figuring out a difficult problem or looking up, uh, some language specific thing in, in code well, how did I ever get that done before we had all these search tools and forums and other other ways of uh, looking up information and asking about it? So I guess I guess my question is, do you think we're losing something in that people who have uh, longer term experience are used to knowing how to uh, synthesize information from various sources and answer a question and answer their own questions um, instead of just running to a forum? Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, the ST forum, and just asking the question. And I guess 
Uh, I'll leave a follow up after that. But uh, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that's a problem? Well, in some respects, yeah. That uh, I, uh, I use Google in a very similar fashion, but people have always commented that I seem to find things that they don't. But I think about the, the think about things that would be on the page, not necessarily what the question is, but what surrounds the question to the point where I can kind of kind of find it. Um, and yeah, I think that I think Google helps significantly, and obviously with the kind of the the death of manuals in a kind of a printed form. I, I'm used. To, I've got like racks of kind of old Intel manuals and and stuff, and that really doesn't exist in its printed form anymore. It's really just a lot of kind of PDFs, and I'm much more of a kind of a book guy where I can kind of fold the pages or stick post-its on things and and have several of them open and. When I'm doing things with PDFs, I might have like 20 or 30 PDFs open. So it's, it can get a bit unmanageable on the screen, sometimes kind of raking through that. And I think that, that, that Google breaks through a lot of that, that you can get to that kind of information quickly. But on the other hand, kind of teaching, I think, has changed and, and how people experience this. Because uh, when, when I was first doing this, we were very resource starved in terms of what what information you had. You had kind of Radio Shack catalogs and you had component catalogs. You couldn't necessarily see a lot of components and you'd have to maybe order manuals and so forth, all these things. So it was more difficult to kind of find that. So you had much a much smaller universe, I guess, in terms of, of, of what was out there. And for many years, it's like you, you didn't have that many microprocessors. Now it's it's exploded significantly. You don't just have like Z80 processors. You've got the STM32 parts. You've got the NXP parts. Then there's hundreds of thousands of kind of different parts, and they're all very different in some of the ways they do things, but very similar in others. And uh, I don't know. Do you think um, do you think vendors have also gotten lazy and that they know that there's a community out there that will support their parts. And so they don't do the, the work on documentation that they used to. I I feel like in certain cases, that's, that's true that the documentation has gotten worse because, well, there's some experts out there and there's the internet and somebody will figure it out and answer these questions. And we don't have to. The depressing question. Well, that and, and and that and good documentation is, is is hard to do. And then tangential to that is that uh, there's some expectation of understanding it's like do, do you do you write it so that you can completely understand all of the concepts or do you do you, do you remove all of that and kind of push that off into kind of a technical reference manual for the processor or other things and and c programming and expect that people have some kind of grasp of kind of well, this, the silicon works this way and these are the registers and registers on peripherals don't really act like memory and what you write to one register might not be the same thing you read back somewhere else. And some of those I think are kind of more kind of learned learned things or things that you, you, you would study from particular books. I, I grew up with a lot of the kind of Lance Leventhal books and uh, Rodney Zach's books in terms of kind of process and so, so forth. And you, you got a pretty good feel there of how the mechanics of the computer worked. And now I think that all of this stuff is kind of buried. It's, kind of, it's, it's hidden away from you and made very pretty. And so you assume that things might be quite easy, but when you'd like dig in under the surface, it's, it's really very complicated and how do you get that knowledge if all you've been presented with uh, computers with like uh, pretty graphical interfaces and uh, a line that you can type into Google? So when we talk about documents, we often talk about the data sheets, which tend to be a little more high level for the software and more electrical. And then we talk about the processor manual, which is usually what you need to program all the registers for using DMA or I2C or or any of the processor stuff. And then for the STM32s, usually those are ARM processors. So if you really want to dig into that, then you're looking at the ARM reference manual or other ARM 
document. Is part of what you're doing just helping people figure out which document or is it, and do you like these documents in the separation or do you wish there was just one? Yeah. The, the ST has a certain way of kind of providing their documentation. I know I can't say that I've looked that deeply into others. And to be honest, I think the, the, the partitioning does make sense because you don't necessarily want to keep revving the, the reference manual just because you've come up with a, a new part that fits in like 32 pins and how, how those are associated because a lot of these, these parts are all using the same die. So it's just really a matter of, well, what pins can you actually escape and where do they, where do they come out and how are they configured? And, and so I can see that there's, a, there's good reason for separation. Yeah, if you if you had it all in one spot, it might be easier for kind of someone to 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 search around. But then I think it would just become unmanageable in terms of how how the documentation is created and distributed. So I can I can see the, the reason behind some of those things. And to be honest, it's I tend to look at lots of different books and get like a different perspective on a problem from, from different sources. And I think one of my friends used to refer to this as triangulation, that you, you, you get many perspectives and then you kind of pull out the, the, the kind of salient information and, and learn from that. So, uh, and, and there are some pretty good books for the arm parts. I know that uh, Joseph Yu has, uh, has a extensive series on the cortex part. A lot of them, again, cover the same material in some respects um, between different families. And uh, these days, I think if you went for his kind of most recent book, it would, you'd probably get enough coverage there for kind of all the prior ones. But uh, he works for him. And, and so I think he has, a, he has an interesting perspective on things, but it's not really as dry as the, the kind of technical register level documentation. It's more of a kind of, here's how you do something here here's how these interrupts work here's how these faults kind of occur so it's it's a more personable i guess uh, kind of perspective perspective on those stuff and what i try and do is try and understand what what someone's actually asking because sometimes they won't ask the right question they 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 leave out important details but you have to kind of like read between the lines in lots of cases and try and figure out well what do they what do they really want to know they they're asking this question but that's really n- not the problem it's like they often describe here are my here are the symptoms that they're, they're seeing but it's like well, that's really not where you you should be looking you need to be looking at the kind of the, the cause for that so you need to step back and go further up the code and try and understand where that is and that's what i try and do a lot of the time is try to try to figure out what the real problem is what knowledge would they need to kind of solve that? And then if there are there's particular documents that have that, then I'll, I'll direct people at that. And sometimes people will come back and they're, 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 maybe they're still using the wrong pen for something. And you go, well, you really need to go check the data sheet there because I don't think there's really not the connectivity there. I think one of the problems, I think, with the STM32 parts in general is the, the ability to escape particular peripheral functions through the pins and... You can't use everything. I think people come to the party sometimes thinking it's like, well, it's got all these six UARTs and all these SPI ports, but realistically, you can't use all of those things at once. You've got to pick a subset of those, and then you've got to work through the data sheet and figure out, well, how do I escape some of that? And I think ST's response to that in some respects is this cube software where you can actually kind of plug in, this is what I want to do, and these are the peripherals I have, and it does what I'd probably historically do with a pencil and paper and a spreadsheet, it kind of says, yeah, you can't do those two things. It's like you can't use that pin for the SPI and the UART. And it can generate some amount of code for them. I am unfamiliar with the ARM Cube software. I heard it used as a why would you do this sort of question. And when I looked at it, it yeah, paper, pencil, maybe an Excel sheet. <laughs> Can you explain a little more about what it is? 
Uh, well, it's ST software. It's, it's so it's specific to the the STM32 series of parts. It's not something that I use a lot because, as I say, it's it's not really the 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 way I solve problems. But it's one of those I would describe it as a fitter application. It's like people would use with FPGAs, where you, you you've got a certain number of pins and it tells you what you can what what's the the optimum way these things will come out. And, so I think you can go through there and you can check different kind of peripherals and so forth that you need. And it, it can generate like a framework. And my understanding is that you can you can add other kinds of drivers for like CAN or USB and select different kind of classes of device. If you make you want to make a virtual serial port or something, I think you can do that. And you press a button and out pops some code that kind of sort of works and... Uh, you fight it from there. And I think one of the issues I think people come up with is, well, what if I change something? What if I change the processor or the package? And I basically have to kind of resynthesize all this again and you know, either it destroys what I've done before or you, you have what you did before and you have to kind of merge things back in. So it's not really a, a tool that I particularly care for. And the, the other thing that they changed in that same realm was this... Uh, how layer, this hardware extraction layer, or abstraction layer. Um, and they changed the paradigm of how things were working because one of the problems you have across the STM32 parts is they've evolved and they, they changed the way they did certain things and how pins were configured and so forth. And uh, it, it tries to deal with the differences in the part under the surface. So the, the abstraction layer gets a bit thicker in terms of how big it is. And the, the paradigm comes a, becomes a bit more complicated in that it kind of hides the interrupts from you. Or when you, when you get an interrupt, you have to call back into the HAL and it in turn calls you back with the callback function. And it, it's just not something that that I particularly like. I much prefer the, the standard peripheral library, which is a fairly thin abstraction and something that ST has been, been using for kind of a figure a decade or so on some of their earlier parts. And it's very similar to things that I've seen on uh, NXP parts and kind of others. Well, there's the ARM specified CMSIS, CMSIS. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. Sorry, so it's, it's pronounced <laughs> Frank. <laughs> yeah, we're pronounced Frank. Um, and is that what you mean by the hardware abstraction layer, the older hardware abstraction layer? No, not really. Or I is think there the, another the, one? The, the, well, I think they 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 evolved the. I guess I call it seamless or something, but uh, I think they evolved it slightly recently to kind of add kind of a real-time operating system into yeah. it. But before that, they'd had it as just a kind of a, a layer that tried to unify parts from different manufacturers. So it, yes. it, it had some consistency in how you set up the NVIC and consistency in how you spoke to the, 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 the debug interfaces and kind of the, the system ticker and so forth. So they had that. An and apparent I've, consistency when you were setting up DNA, DMA and serial or I squared C, although well, I don't think the actual were, underlayers were not usually very consistent with what yeah, they well, did. I, I, I think that the arm at their level basically told uh, told people to kind of try and have some uniformity in in how you do this, but that's really where you, you run into kind of headaches with arm parts. Is that basically the core has a lot of uniformity that. But then everyone else has their own take on how to how to build a user art, how to build an SPI interface, and how the SPI interface generates kind of chip selects, and how the DMA kind of interacts with with things, and how wide the counters are, and how wide the addresses are. So that that's where it always gets very murky in terms of porting things from kind of one platform to another. And I'm not sure that this necessary helps with that that much it's it, it definitely brings some consistency but then people have had free rtos and other things and uh, the the micrium operating systems they've always been kind of fairly fairly consistent but the the peripherals always that's always been a battle and i think it, it had been a battle with st as they as they changed some of their part functionality that you really couldn't you couldn't port it at a register level well that's kind of where they those companies differentiate themselves too, because 
beyond just implementing a Cortex M flavor, I mean, you, the peripherals is where you put in some magic. Oh, I have this DMA mode that nobody else has, or I have uh, support for 27 spies. or So it's kind of, that's where they want to put their secret sauce, so I can understand how it all gets a little bit muddled. Well, and it looks like this with this cube thing, they, they've run out of that secret sauce. And now they're saying, well, how can we make it so people who don't know what they're doing can do this? And even though it might be a little slower to run, that's okay. We'll just bump them into the next processor with these silly callbacks. And the cube seems neat on the surface. But as you said, uh, when you have to change something, either you have to go into their code and find where to change it. And it's pretty complex. It's not the most straightforward code that's generated. Or you have to regenerate it and hope you didn't make any changes you needed. Um, it's, yeah, I the cube stuff I'm not excited about. The CM sys, I've used a few times, although I get annoyed when I walk through things because it's, it's not really written for efficiency. And when I have to walk through that code, it's usually because I'm doing battery-related things. And so I, I really am interested in them using everything they know about the processor to give us the most optimal solution. And instead, they're providing code that is reasonably readable, which is a different set of criteria for goodness. Yeah, and I think well, I think the other problem with it, with Cube has been that it, I think it's written by Java programmers, so they I think they have a different perspective on on the world than your your average embedded. Yes, engineer. yes. And as I say, Java uh, mixing Java and C or even C sharp are all supported by the Cube stuff, which makes my head explode just a little bit. Wait, Java? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. And you could write with the Microsoft.NET micro framework development I've never even heard of that. I, yes, it's all in I mean, I know what .NET is, but I, I didn't realize there was a, quote, embedded version. That's terrifying. <laughs> well, all of those are, yeah, all of those are, you Heavy know. Heavyweight. No, they're, they're, they're uh, virtual machine-based bytecode languages. So that's that's very strange that you'd want to put that on something small, but. Yeah, I think it's it's really the the familiarity with the development system and, and pushing it on, on onto different parts. And people have uh, kind of JavaScript. There's some projects that put JavaScript on STM 32s. Projects that put a kind of uh, Java itself. Elau is another one that I see quite a lot. And didn't you tell me there was a scheme too? <laughs> that's a different that, that that's a that's a bare metal scheme implementation. We won't go there. <laughs> I'll put that in a link for anybody who cares. But um yeah, and I, I think I think the motivation there is is the the, the framework vendors, Microsoft, uh Oracle, really want to get their fingers in everything and, and they're seeing they're seeing people maybe seeing a, a large explosion in products, Internet of Things uh, devices and so on that they don't have a, a foothold in. So, I mean, Microsoft just released an open source uh, Objective-C framework for Windows 10. So iOS developers can write iPhone code and then port it immediately to Windows. So they're clearly, uh, there's clearly a desire to just so everyone's, make everyone's everything work rushing, everywhere. Yeah, Everyone's rushing to, to put things on Microsoft phones and tablets. Yeah, and they want to make it quite easy, I guess. <laughs> Please, please come. Yes. No, it, uh, as I say, I, I, I don't think it's not it's not targeted to people like us. I don't think. I think yeah. it's it's targeted at people who are like, yes, embedded looks cool. It's like, how do I do that? I want to be able to press this button and select a bunch of things and magically out of the end pop some code. But I, you run into a trap there that you really don't know how any of it works, and it's like, it, it and the paradigm for doing it is just different from anything that I've I've used actively before. I understand the concept and I understand the mechanics of, of, of how these callbacks work. And I've dealt with Windows device drivers that had kind of asynchronous callbacks and so forth and all the fun fun that was involved there. But uh, it just doesn't work well for the way I look at things. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It just means that... It, Someone else is probably going to have to figure it out, and I've basically on the forum have stepped back from kind of trying to deal with some of those things because it's like I, I can tell you what makes sense, 
but I really can't tell you why that particular piece of code doesn't work, or and I'm not going to dig into it. But uh. so you did mention much earlier digging in on a data sheet for an accelerometer you've never used, and that makes me wonder how much time do you spend answering questions on the forum? Probably not as much as you think, because. Uh, I, 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 I tend to work quite quickly in terms of those things. And uh, I, I've, as I say, I've, I've used some Bosch uh, accelerometers before, so I'm kind of interested in that. But a lot of these things, it's like I can leverage against what I, what I do. So knowing what components are out there and what kind of applications people have is of general use to me um, because some of, the, some of the products that we build – a more kind of open platform in that uh, we, we give you the hardware and the, some of the kind of the, the software to go with that. But really, I don't want to write your product because th there's so many ways to solve problems and so many problems to be solved that it's, I'd much prefer someone else to, to solve their particular problem in the way that they want to do. So a lot of these things with timers and ADCs and DMA and hooking these things up, I've got a lot of that code, and a lot of it's a matter of just kind of cutting and pasting, kind of free writing little bits to kind of glue these things together. Because I've got enough understanding of the mechanics behind what's happening to kind of know what should work and what won't work, and what pieces I need to to pick up. And I've probably got twenty or thirty years of kind of code sitting on different machines because I pretty much kept everything that I've I've done over the years. So. Writing something to, to do a specific task is something that I do a lot. I tend to, tend to build tools to solve problems. Does your day job know or, and encourage your forum hobby? Um, I'm not sure that they, 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 they fully understand some of, some of the aspects of, of, of things that I do. But it's like I, I've historically worked on forums all, all the all the years I, I've been out here. And as I say, it's more of the, one of those kind of idle tasks where you, you, you're you thinking about another problem and you you haven't got a solution for that. And so you're, you're thinking about thinking about things. Um, but in all circumstances, when I've been hired to work at places, they, 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 they basically came to me because they know of my skills. And so... I, I tend to be the person in the office that people would come talk to. So if you, if they've had a problem for a couple of days and things just aren't making sense, that they come talk to me and I try to fiddle, fiddle around with the, the thing in my head and figure out, well, what are they actually doing and, and what, why that's the, the problem? Because they've got some very good uh, problem-solving skills and I guess listening and uh, descriptive skills in terms of resolving those kind of problems. So it's a matter of where to look, I think. It's like, how, how do you understand the problem, where to look? So on your profile, you do invite donations, and you do say that they can email uh, for paid support. Has that led to anything, or has that primarily been a way to find new jobs for you? Um, to be honest, it really... It, you don't really get much in the way of kind of donations of hardware or anything. It's usually people don't read what you've said and they, they think that they should get some kind of, uh, kind of individual handholding. And I really, that's the reason I, I like the forums is because it, it, it has a, a mechanical advantage in that you can reach a lot of people. You can reach a lot of people with the answer that you give and also kind of people who have the same problem in the future that, uh, they Google into the into the problem and it, it solves it there. So I don't tend to to like private kind of interactions on specific kind of problems, and it seems to encourage more people who are like studying. I guess a lot of students and, and so forth do my homework for me. Yeah, that kind of thing. It's like I've got this problem. It's like okay, well, I'm not going to get any of my work done. Um, uh, ST has been pretty good over the years. They, one of the things that works well with the form is that they don't really interfere. Um, and 
I've gotten various bits of hardware from them and from time to time, and uh, that's worked out quite well in terms of uh, how we interact with them and how we, how we buy parts from them. And um, Wait a minute, how your company buys parts? Or I yeah, guess, has, uh, does ST contact you because of your extensive forum posting? Yeah, I've, I've spoken. I, I, I've got certainly plenty of contacts within ST that uh, actually work on the STM32 parts and have had conversations with, with them in the past. But, uh, and it's helped in terms of getting kind of evaluation boards and that kind of thing. Do they acknowledge you're doing their job for them? <laughs> well, he is. In, 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 in some respects, yeah. That is like the, I think they're, they're they're pretty proud of the kind of the, the form that they have running and the the kind of the the the, the interactions they have there. Um, but I, I just don't really think that it's, it's a very hard thing to do. To, to find the people that to do that, you really have to kind of have a a, a a community. Let's say I don't know other 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 peripheral or other silicon vendors do actually people that have people that staff the forums and and participate. But uh, you sometimes wonder where they fit into things and if they've got the right answers or I don't know. It, okay. Why the ST forums? There are a lot of forums out there. So why ST? Do you um, prefer ST boards or ST processors, or is it just a good place for generic ARM questions? They have some very good silicon. To be honest, it's like uh, I, I used to work for Philips many years ago, and I, I, I majored in IC design and worked on kind of IC test and, and validation and things like that. So I've got like a pretty good perspective on those kind of things. But the the ST forum was just had the right feel to it. I, I as I say, I, I'd used a lot of the ST parts and I do participate in a number of other uh, ARM forums, but uh, they have good parts. The, they're not constantly uh, revising the silicon. So you don't have to keep track of one part that has four or five different variants and they all behave slightly differently when when it comes to the DMA or something. They, obviously, they have errata, but uh, they tend to be very fairly limited. And then, as I say, there's, there's not dozens of steppings of the parts. So they're, they're easier parts to, I, I guess, support. And uh, as I say, I, I quite like them as parts, but uh, I've used Atmel parts in the past. We I think some of the Atmel products that we have use a lot of ARM9, ARM9 parts in a kind of embedded Linux kind of perspective, which is a, a different type of embedded. But uh, I tend to prefer pro the, the, the microprocessor level a lot better. Do you use RTOS as much? To be honest, I don't. Uh, it's I, I've in, in products I've worked on, we've we've used free RTOS and Micrium operating systems. But a lot of the stuff that I try to work on, I tend to just have kind of work it through kind of interrupts and interactions between loops and interrupts and data structures. Well, I should ask you the question we we sort of failed to ask answer last week. Uh, when do you use an RTOS? When do you decide that an RTOS is necessary? I think when it get when things get really complicated when or well, if you have like file systems and things where you've got a lot of kind of asynchronous activity it, it, it sometimes makes sense to it, it would simplify things at that point and you had lots of different tasks and threads running whereas as i say i i tend to go for the more simpler kind of perspective where i, I have interrupts that do certain things and i have state machines and and work problems in, in in that direction as opposed to just having a task that has one particular thing that it does and then it it, it waits on a flag before it continues to do other things. But it, I think if you've got something that fits in that kind of model where it needs lots of threads or processes, that's obviously where you'd probably want to, to, to focus on an R task. That sounds remarkably similar to what we said. So, cool. Uh, well, that's scary <laughs> in some respects, but... Uh, yeah, the, the, a lot of things don't really need that level of complexity. But then, 
as I say, file, files and things that interact with media where you want to retry things and you, you really want to keep that abstraction away from whatever's collecting the data perhaps and, and, and be able to deal and retry things. And I guess that's one issue I guess I have with some of the, the ST examples or examples in general. They tend to kind of ignore what goes wrong. It's like if everything works fine, if if you don't get kind of errors, but that when when you get an error, everything kind of falls over and breaks. The the the, the implementation for the SDIO attached to the FAT FS. It's like if it, if one comes back and says, "Yeah, I can't read the the sector." It's like it blows all the way back up through to the to the application, and then the application says, "Oh, I'm really stuck here." Whereas more considered, I guess, approaches would have kind of retries at various levels and try to figure out, well, what is this error and is this recoverable? Is it is it mash of the cards not installed properly? Is it is it something that I can reset and and try again, or is it something that I can I need to try more than once? So I guess that's that's one problem with some of these examples and probably the cube stuff that it's like, yeah, it it, it produces produces some code, but it's not really production ready. You still have to spend some time and effort to uh, kind of figure out where the flaws are. And that's a good thing to point out. It's really not production ready and it may not do what you want when you think about the whole system. I mean, sure, it does what you want when you think about all of the pins and what they need to do, but still error handling and you know, is it doesn't care if this is a debug port. And so, you know, if you fail to handle it in time, it's sort of okay. But this port over here belongs to something important. So you must never fail. It It's just, it's hard to do that programmatically, which is what Cube is, a programmatic way to do the initialization. Yeah, I see it as like kind of rough plumbing or rough carpentry. It's like, yeah, you've 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 tagged all this stuff together, and it's like, look, it works. And it's like, yeah, well, until I do this, yeah. So, and I, th- I think that's 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 probably a, a problem that the future generation here is going to have to have to deal with. It's like, well, it, it's only getting you halfway. You still really have to understand the mechanics behind it. Sounds like you never trust you, the auto router. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's one of those problems. Like, yeah, it's gonna, it can make you a wonderful board, but it's like you you take that to the PCB guy, and he's like, "Yeah, you could half the price of this board if you didn't do that." So yeah, I yeah. Can see that. So and yeah, at some point you still ha- you still have to physically understand how the, how these things work, and I guess that's what I try to do here. Some of the time is is say, "Look, it's like, yeah, that's all well and good, but it's like you really need to understand these aspects of." how this is going to work. Well, it's sort of like there. people say more and more about how hardware and more and more software is like Lego blocks and you just stick them together. Except... I wouldn't build my house out of Lego blocks. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody builds bridges out of Lego blocks. And, you know, then you, that's not even a metaphor at that point. That's actual mechanical stuff. No offense to Legos. Uh, sure, Legos are great for what they are, but please don't build my house out of Legos. Yeah, well, I've always thought of like computers as, as, as kind of Lego kits where you can make your own parts. But uh, that's generally my philosophy of these things. I, I, as I say, I've, I tend to kind of build tools to, to enable doing other things. And if, I, if I'm doing something that I think I'm going to do more than once, I'll write a script. I'll write a little kind of naughty program that does, does that particular function or looks at a PLL setting or looks at some PLL registers and I kind of plug in at one end the kind of clock they want to come out and the clock that I'm putting in, and it can spit out like half a dozen different register combinations to kind of get you to that point. And so it, that tends to make my life and work easier, that I'm not doing everything manually all the time. That, uh, that you, you can get a significant degree of mechanical advantage by just letting the computer do the, the, the stupid work. I think that's one of the things with being experienced and being around for a while is you do accumulate these tools. People sometimes are surprised when I look at the map file and can make it look pretty, although I've even gotten out of the habit of that because I'm just so used to the map files looking the way they do and I could read them. But for somebody new, that's such a, what's in there? How do I find it? And it, it gets tough. 
It's a skill that takes time to learn. Well, you have to have used it a few times for a reason. You can't just say, well, today I'm going to go look at a map file. Well, the way that I got good at it was writing a tool so that I could see it in in, uh, HTML, probably. Yeah, HTML. And so I could like graphically see how big my memory was, and then I could find the one that was big. And that got me used to using the map files, and that got me... So now that I don't need the tool. <laughs> well, yeah, I've done similar things with kind of disassembly listings and, and map files that you kind of, you put them into something and crunch on them and you can come out with like cross-reference data. You can come out with kind of sizes of things like you say, and and you can kind of, obviously if you used HTML, you could probably kind of drill down into different things through the through the browser Hyperlink interface. It, yeah. I, I, I've not really, I've not really, tried that kind of stuff but it, it, it it's it's a familiar sounding thing and it's it's yeah it's like that you're not scared to kind of write a script in a walk or something else that just kind of munches on the files and kind of spits it out in a kind of a usable fashion especially if you can plug that into a make file so that every time it kind of builds your application it's looking for some kind of critical problem it's like the the your, your particular routine got too big and that's going to be a problem for, for, for timing or something. And I've built things with the, the process listing files and like look at the instructions and kind of attribute a, a kind of clock cycles to it. It's a lot harder to do now with kind of caches and other things, but back with like 68,000 processes, you could very easily go through the op codes and give a pretty good estimation of exactly how many clock cycles something would take and then accumulate that across a subroutine or whatever. So, yeah, I think a lot of people these days just, they're reliant on the tools that they have and really don't understand how they can get the information they want. They're then dependent on the tool vendor to, to kind of provide something. Whereas I'd look at a dot, hex file and say, yeah, well, I can parse that really easily and uh, I can I can generate that in a different form or I can package the firmware up, a couple of firmwares together. I can put checksums across the across the images that I create and automate that portion of the kind of the ROM generation, let's say, in terms of, of, of how things are built. And that's not necessarily something that comes with part of the IDE, but in terms of making something that, that works right in production each time, it, it, it saves a lot of time. What compilers do you prefer and what IDEs? Um, I've primarily used Kyle for a lot of the stuff that I do. I've used IAR to some degree. It, 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 it strikes me as a bit more awkward, um, but that's, I think, for the familiarity oh. I have with Kyle. <laughs> um, Rowley is very good. I think we... One of the, the, the parts we used, uh, the, the vendor had used Rowley as their, their tool set. So that, that tends to drive things a lot too. It's like, well, where is this code coming from? Who's going to use it? And kind of what does their management prefer as a tool? So often people don't necessarily get to pick what IDE they, they get to use. They pretty much get uh, one, one pushed on them by someone else. Um, and the other thing that I use a lot is uh, the Microsoft Visual C. Um, just basically a command line compiler. If I was on uh, Linux most of the time, I just use GNU C and, and build stuff there. But just build like command line applications just to do very simple things. Testing and, like, things? And these like, yeah. scripty things that we were talking about? Yeah, kind of testing things or generating register content. That's one that I... When I, when I read through the kind of reference manuals or the data sheets, it's telling me about certain limits on kind of what the PLL comparison frequencies should be and what are the minimum and maximum values for various things. And so I'll write little applications there that kind of fit what I want against the four or five different registers that I might have to set, and it will spit out. Uh, so sort of optimum settings or a couple of different yeah. optimum settings for those kind of things. So it might be programs that run like a couple hundred lines, but uh, the sort of things you can kind of write from scratch very easily and don't take a lot of time. I use Excel for that. It's horrible. I mean, it looks horrible. It's horrible code. It's terrible. But yes, I, yeah. I understand. Yeah, I've not really been a, a big adopter of, of, of Excel over the years. I, I can use it, but I, I haven't really used it. My, my father 
And he was one of the first guys that had one of these TI calculators, uh, programmable calculators with a, uh, kind of, I think it was like a magnetic strip card that you could run through it. And so we always used to think about how, how those kind of worked. And he built a quite an extensive library for the, the company that he worked for in a, kind of a mechanical engineering perspective to kind of compute the size of shafts and uh, tapers on uh, uh, mechanical pieces of equipment. And at some point he handed off a lot of this kind of algorithm stuff to people that uh, that would put it into Excel. So he never actually made the Excel sheets. He understood the concept, obviously, but uh, other people had a much better grasp of, well, how do, how do I express that in Excel and, and how can we kind of put an interface on that? And I guess that's probably where I would fall down. It's like, yeah, I can put equations in there, but putting a kind of a, a menu on the front of it or kind of automating, I think, would probably be a bit more awkward for me. So as I say, I've always used C as that kind of interface. Um, I've done Pascal before. I've done some Orc. Uh, but uh, I've also, I, I, when, when I was at college, we, we, we had Linux machines that had the mental graphics IC software on. So I kind of got used to to that kind of stuff, and then uh, VAX machines as well. But the, the common denominator typically was always C, that you could always get something working quickly enough with that. So from compilers to scripting methods to processors, which processors do you prefer? I mean, there's ST has a lot, and all of them have a lot, NXP and TI and Atmel. But do you have any ones that you... When somebody says, well, we should use this for a processor, you're like, yeah, let's use that. Or any that you want to talk about that you think, oh, no, not that. Um, well, not so much. I, as, uh, I came from a background where we used like 68,000 processors and ARM. And uh, that had a very uniform and uh, consistent uh, instruction set and ARM is very much like that so I, I like that perspective and the Cortex parts have, have made things a lot easier certainly with respect to kind of interrupts and stuff so the ARM 7 and ARM 9 has got a lot more awkward both in terms of that and the kind of alignment of data structures and things and the Cortex fixed a lot of those problems um, in terms of what I'm looking at these days uh, the, the Cortex M7 is is quite interesting. It's a big uh, one to run bare metal. Yeah, I think it's getting a bit out a bit bit out there, but uh, I'm not sure that I like ST's implementation. They went with the the single single precision floating point, which I think is a problem because I think people tend to use floating point as a crutch to solve kind of size issues with the numbers that they're working on, but when you get to like 32 bit floating point, you, you don't really have a lot of precision. And certainly in the GPS arena where I've done a lot of work, you really need the kind of double precision floating point. I think that's one place where kind of Atmel had made some better decisions in terms of their Cortex M7, seven parts, because you can pretty much pick different combinations of IP from ARM to do that. And, I understand why ST went the way they did because they think that the, the the double precision core probably is three to four times bigger in terms of the silicon. But on the other hand, you you haven't really made that big of an advance over the the M4 part in terms of its floating point. So, yeah, it seems to me if you were going to be running a 32-bit processor with 216 megahertz. You said that as if that's a large number. It is a large number compared to most of these. A megabyte of flash, and okay, it's only got 320K of RAM, but still. Uh, it just, yeah, I just think at that point you have enough processing power to do lots of things that unless you're a super specialized th uh, application, you probably are doing floating point. And you don't get any more precision when you go to 32-bit floating point versus 64-bit or 32-bit floating point versus 32-bit fixed point. You just no, get in fact, different you lose precision. Stuff. Yeah, well, you've, you've, now your number's got to fit in 24 bits, and it's like, yeah, people see. I think it's the biggest trap for for the for the beginners because I don't think they really 
conceive of the the, the 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 loss of precision that they just realize it's like well i can put this huge range of numbers in here and it's like well yeah but if you start doing any math on those numbers pretty soon you get the wrong answer and you don't understand why you got the wrong answer so i don't know yeah it, some of these points it's like yeah you're pretty much getting to the point where it's like yeah we'll run, run linux on it have all of that kind of support in terms of kind of operating system and tools and so forth. Obviously, it's going to add some degree of overhead. But if you're running at two or 400 megahertz, you've, you've got some to burn. Yeah, and that line keeps moving down. Well, Linux the cheaper keeps a little processors. thinner, and the processors, the cheap processors get a little heftier. So they're meeting more and more. Did ST make the floating point decision? Do they get to say, well, our power numbers are better? Uh, oh, there must yeah. have been some trade-off. They said, well, we're going to do it this way because then well, we can advertise this feature. Size of silicon is money. I mean, that means that this right. processor is probably cheaper than the equivalent in a different vendor. Or a better well, margin. Think, well, yeah. it's, definitely something, it's definitely something I talked to them very early on because it's like when it first came, when they first announced that they were doing it, it's like, well, hang on a second. It's like, that doesn't really help me. It's Obviously, the, the things that I might use it on, what other people might use it for. But it seems to be like a critical thing to have. If, you, if you're doing something with significantly more horsepower, you've got some different expectations for it. So um, my feeling was really that it just made the die significantly bigger. And it becomes much more critical, I think, in terms of like the speed you can run things at and where the critical paths are. I haven't really done any kind of silicon design in, in that kind of area, but uh, it strikes me that that kind of, thing is going to be frequency limiting. And so if just at the back of an envelope, I seem to think that it's probably going to use like three or four times as much kind of silicon just to do that. But the other conversation you have with them is, well, the, the core is now becoming a very, very small part of the entire device. If you've got a megabyte of flash right. on there and you've got 256 K plus of RAM, that's taken a very large amount of space. The peripherals are probably taking quite an extensive amount of space. And so where the core fits into that shrinks and shrinks. So I, I would, I would, the only thing that I can really think of is probably test time and kind of maximum frequency that they, they felt that there was a problem there. But on the other hand, Atmel has a part that runs at 300 megahertz and delivers a, a double precision floating point. So I don't know. It, it's hard sometimes to get into people's head about why why they made a particular decision about kind of options with with the par and kind of how they routed pins. I think that's another one of my kind of pet peeves. It's like you you've overloaded these pins to the point where I can't escape anything. You, if, especially if you've got like an LCD or an SD RAM on there, you've just eaten. 40 or 50 pins in a go. And it's like, you, you can't really recover from that in some circumstances. One of the features of this chip, the uh, Cortex M7 uh, from ST, is the adaptive real-time accelerator. Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's it's basically their their answer to a caching mechanism. Because one thing that ARM did with the the, the Cortex M3 parts was pretty much dispense entirely of a, a caching architecture. Um, so what ST has done is put something in front of the the flash memory because the flash despite whatever they can do with it, is intrinsically very slow. It probably has an access time in the order of like 35 nanoseconds for any particular line that they pull out. And I think that they they have a flash line that's about 128 bits wide, so 16 bits wide. And what they've done is basically put a cache in front of the, of the, the flash memory so that it can kind of prefetch lines from the, from the flash and that it can cache kind of more recent... Uh, accesses. And the other thing that it does with the Cortex M3 and M4 parts is there's a, a prefetch on the kind of instruction side to, to grab the next instruction. And what the, the cache does in that situation is basically get you to a kind of uh, within the same cycle. So it's, it's not like zero wait state. You're basically like a minus one wait state that it, it already has the data so it can complete within the, the current cycle as opposed to even 
SRAM cells are going to be one cycle away in terms of putting out an address and getting back the data. So the way the cache works in this situation means that effectively you, you, you can run out of flash as fast as and sometimes faster than uh, that you can out of RAM. And so that's exciting. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how it works on the M. I think the M7 has something different because I think architecturally the the M7 has has some caching kind of designed in at a, kind of a core level. But uh, uh, certainly on the 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 F4 parts, it, it made a significant difference because the F1 parts you were pretty much exposed to the the slowness of the the flash, and that's always as I say it's always been a problem for these guys and. For for the other other IC vendors is that they can't really get the can, the, the flash speed any any higher. So if you're if you're stalling kind of three cycles for every read of the the flash memory, pretty soon your kind of seventy two megahertz processor is running significantly <laughs> slower. And it's like, well, why is why is, why has this got the responsiveness of something running like twenty four megahertz? And you go, well, that's how fast the it's how fast the flash runs, and so you can't you can't really break out of that other than kind of copying stuff into RAM and running it from RAM, and the RAM being kind of thirty two bits wide in lots of these situations. That that's a more efficient place to come from, but that had other problems. <laughs> well, yeah, and then there's DMA from your flash to your RAM, and then running from the RAM and hoping that you've DMA'd it. Well, and you have to have enough RAM to put your oh, code man, in. There's just so without, many problems. You know, caches are yeah. nice. <laughs> Yes, well, they they hide a lot of the ugliness, and I think, I guess, one of the things you 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 come upon when you use ARM processors as opposed to, you know, Intel x86 based systems is, Intel worked through all of the bottlenecks and problems and put lots and lots and lots of silicon in there to kind of fix and hide the very subtle issues. Whereas the the the, the ARM solution really is, it's like you don't do that. We're not going to put the silicon in there to protect you. You you you're just going to have to kind of work around that, and I guess that's one of the the issues that we've run into a couple of times with Cortex M3 and uh, STM32 parts, where th- you have a pipeline processor, and the way it tail chains interrupts is as you're writing to the NVIC to kind of clear the interrupt, or writing to the peripheral, I guess, to to, to clear the interrupt that's poking the NVIC. That doesn't happen. Instantly. So, if you if the last thing you do before you return from the subroutine is clear the the source of the interrupt, it pretty much immediately re-enters um, because it's still signaling kind of down the line that that this hasn't occurred and the the right buffers haven't kind of gotten out to the peripheral across buses that run at slower speeds, and so you 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 end up with like a phantom interrupt that uh, re-enters and. Uh, you wonder why why your code is broken if you haven't checked to see that validated the source. And I guess one of the other ones, what was one of the other ones? Yeah, the people modifying timer registers. That it's like, yeah, you can't really do anything atomically at the processor level because the peripheral behind it is changing things. I think one of the uh, things they did with the timing status register is that they basically said this you only need to write these mask values to this register to clear them you don't read it and write it back with a kind of read modify write type instruction and a lot of people miss that but it the 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 people making the silicon understood what was going on and specifically accounted for the situation where it's like yeah if you do a read modify write on this and an interrupt or a status change occurs in between you reading it and writing it back out, you're going to end up kind of clearing that because you're ending it with something that's not there. So it's like those are the kind of traps that, that are in there, and you see less of that kind of thing with kind of Intel processors, but significantly more with kind of risk-based processors like the ARM. Switching subjects a bit, although... Probably another one where we sort of need a whiteboard to get through this. Um, I have a few friends who, if you just say I squared C and ST in the same sentence, their eyes start to bug out in horror. Have you found that ST's I squared C implementation is not as robust as it could be? 
Oh, it's hideous. Um, <laughs> it, it is. Well, the thing, the other thing is that I worked for Philips, as I say, and uh, I did did some IC design there, and I did work on I I two C buses. Um, it, it's a very clunky interface at the the best of times, and then ST tried to kind of manage it within the silicon, and I'm not quite sure where the value of that is, but uh, it, it seems to the, the state machine that they have can get into kind of odd states and just it, it just breaks down so i tend to it's like if i see one of those questions it's like i quietly back away from it because it's like <laughs> i just th- there's no good outcome the the at some point i would probably just prefer to kind of bit bang the bus because it, it, that would be i know that i can make that work and i guess that's probably the the other thing with kind of experience it's like yeah i i know how i can get this to work in a certain time frame it's like i can play with this other thing and it looks kind of like it might manage it but it's like you still have to deal with all of the kind of the the, the error states that it might get into or the fact that it locks up these peripherals because the peripherals are pretty stupid it's like and most of them don't have a kind of a uh, an asynchronous reset signal going to them so if you get them all confused the there's 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 not much hope of like recovering from that. Well, that's you why can, you need you know, a FET to their power lines on every probably GPIO. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like to make them shut up. I guess that's one of the other issues I had with uh, one of the accelerometers. It had like a pin, so you could select between SPI and I squared C, and then there were issues with the state of that pin was at reset and how yes. things were pulled up. And it's like. It, that's just always a bad thing. It's like, yeah, we need to have a, we definitely need to have a pull up resistor on that, or we'll preferably not connect it to the processor at all, because then it doesn't do anything weird when it starts. Yeah, uh, it should just be a resistor. I mean, why why would you hook that to your processor? Your processor is going to want to speak I squared C or spy, not to choose. be fair. I squared C is always a mess every time I use it anywhere. Well, I think one of the things is, is like a chip select. It's like a chip select for the it's the chip select for the SPI, and it also selects whether it's I squared C or SPI. And so it's one of these kind of nightmare situations. It's an eight pin part. They're 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 pin limited, and the the device. Yeah, this just just not a good good way of de- <laughs> good way of dealing with that. So I've had those kind of frustrations, and I think yeah. And the other thing is, you you, you over the years you learn to recognize where all the traps are. And so someone the, the the first thing someone says, well my my part doesn't do this, or it's like the the software reset doesn't work. And the first thing you think of is you haven't driven the end reset with a push pull driver, right? Because that that's a bi-directional signal and you, your part won't reset properly at all if, if that's the case. And then other people that assume that the, the, the they're generating the end reset signal and if you've got some other part that thresholds the power supply and drives it low, it resets their entire system. So it's like, well, wh- why, why does, my, when you turn off this other modem or whatever, why does it reset my, my computer? It's like, <laughs> well, well, because the, power failed on it it's like the the, the 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 specifications for the part said you always supply power to it and you send this other pin that says turn on and turn off you don't remove the power from it you always supply power and you effectively control it with a different signal and this end reset comes back because it's figured out that the the, the supply disappeared so you get those kind of things but yeah there's a lot of those kind of pitfalls and traps that you you see someone writing about something and they're they're talking about something totally different and it's like no 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 you need to step way 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 back here because your problem is you're doing this this one other thing so there's there's usually like a couple of things where I see, if I see something it's like then I'll bang out like four or five things where I think that that's almost immediately going to fail for some reason or another and see if they can pick one of the four or five reasons that I've supplied for it not working and they'll say well i was doing number four and it's like yeah well that's why it breaks and this is how you can remedy that that's such a great i mean i know this is your hobby and i know i understand doing it because it makes you feel helpful it makes you feel good i yes being right is always nice (laughs) but um do you ever meet people you know from the forum do people buy you at beer at conferences for helping them um, I've had one guy that's kind of bought me beers and 
Beers and Food is the, one of the, the guys on there is reasonably local to us here. And there's a couple of other guys that I recognize on the, the forum. We, we, we kind of chat out of band occasionally, either Skype or, or email, and have our own amusing kind of views on things that are going on on the forum, that uh, kind of a behind the scenes kind of thing, I guess, where we just kind of chuckle to ourselves. And, but uh, no, it's more of a kind of not necessarily being right all the time, although that obviously kind of helps and, and people appreciate that. But uh, I think it's really making a difference because it, I think it's hard out there and people don't tend to get a lot of help. And they're, they're kind of thrown into these things, whether it's through their kind of coursework or employment, that the, there's a very high level of expectation of what they should know coming into things. And it, it, I think it's sometimes unreasonable to expect people to know all these things. And so it, being helpful, I think, is the, is the primary thing. Doing good, making a difference, kind of changing the outcome is kind of is, is the way that I look at it. And it's just so much more helpful than calling people idiots and saying, read, read the fine manual. Cause it's like, yeah, you can be a troll and that that's really easy to do, but it's like, it doesn't really, it doesn't really advance anything. It's like, why do you come here? So I looked at the most active users on the ST forum and there's a system account with 2071 posts. And then there are two Clive one accounts. They're both you, right? Yes, I've, I think I've probably got at least three there, and that I think stems from the kind of dysfunctional Microsoft forum software that that uh, I had an email address that, that that my ISP was functional for about twenty years before they decided that they could make more money uh, uh, doing kind of consulting and kind of uh, turning up at your business and fixing your network type of work, and they kind of got out of it. Um, and all of ST stuff is predicated on a, an email address. And they would periodically send out emails to that address and say, hey, we've reset your password. You need to kind of log in with this other password. And obviously, having the account disappear meant that the, my ability to log in disappeared. And discussions with them about, well, wouldn't this be an obvious thing that someone would want to change about their profile? It was like, well, we can't do that. It's not how it works. And I, I don't know how true that is or how broken this Microsoft implementation is, but it, it was just like, okay, whatever. I'll just just start up another one with a new account. But I, That's I don't really horrible. Ca- I'm sorry, because what's horrible is you had over 11,000 posts before you switched over to one that now has 20, uh, almost 2,200 posts. Yeah. You had 11,000 posts and they couldn't make an exception for you? Well, I don't know if I really pushed it that hard. It's just like, it's not that important, to be honest, because, and that's in this current iteration of this forum. There's been a like, I think they've gone through at least one different kind of software version. And there's one where it had like a spectacular meltdown where it just kind of blew everything away and they, they kind of had to kind of rebuild it from scratch or get the engineers from Microsoft to kind of piece it back together. But uh, so there's probably at least another like, 10,000 posts that I even included in the numbers that, that you're giving. So I don't care about it. <laughs> it, it. It's one of those things where it's like people either know that it's, the answer is good or they don't. And it's like, I, I don't see it as a medal at this point. And I just think you should get like t-shirts and badges and, and cars for 25,000 posts or something. <laughs> That's just amazing. <laughs> I mean, that is a lot of people helped. Yeah, but some of those, some of those are just kind of like not necessarily all helpful. Some of them no. are just kind of one-liners or something or dings. If ten percent are helpful, that's still huge. Yeah, I think but you should so, treat this as a long con, and and at this point, just start giving wrong answers. <laughs> Everything, <laughs> not Clive, and it's like I will give a wrong answer. Everything or the grumpy aunt, the grumpy Clive, or something. And it's like. Yeah, I don't know. And then you could have arguments with yourself. This sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah, Why is your avatar picture so terrifying? I don't know. It's 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 random Randall Duck Kim, as I think the name of the guy. He's he was the key maker in the the Matrix before I before I had that one. It was oh. like it was Neo, but uh, no, I. It, it, it's basically an inside joke I have with some other kind of other friends from other forums that I worked on over the years. And so 
I don't think, the, yeah, the, the, the thousands of posts here map against thousands of posts on other ones in years, years past. And the thing that I find is that it's like these things melt down and break, but it's like Google remembers everything. So it's like I don't, I don't keep copies of what I've done. I just kind of bang it in there. And, and if I need to go find my own posts, I'll go on use Google to find them because that's usually the easiest way because the, the, the form software is so busted yeah. that you can't, you, can't, you can't search on a particular individual to find their posts. So you can't kind of, you remember a particular user had, had posted a question and it was on one of three or four different forum pages. It's like, where the hell did that go? And who, yeah, and you can't really click on them. And that's, that's, that's frustrating sometimes. And finding my own posts obviously is frustrating, but as I say, Google just catalogs everything. So it's like you bang it into Google, and I can usually find a, a salient post pretty quickly. And if that's all that needs to need to be done, I can just kind of stick in a, a URL, and off you go. But uh, I uh, noticed that putting this together, that I couldn't, I couldn't just search for you and look at all of your solutions. Which I think, I think if they allowed that people would do it pretty often yeah well i i, I either search on my um, on the username or the the email address i put in everything because that's the other thing it's like i tend to tag all the examples just so that uh, someone can find me if they really need to and i guess the other thing is i'm somewhat amused if it, if it ends up in different things because uh that there's so much code out there that it, it gets to contaminate everything. And that's, I guess, the other reason I don't put copyright notices on everything because it, A, it's pointless, and, and B, I'd kind of like these things to kind of have a life beyond me. So I don't tend to like forums for a number of reasons that we don't have to go into. But are there ways to write questions so that I get good answers? Oh, my question. Yeah, the, well, there's a couple of things, and 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 I guess this 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 goes to kind of how I deal with things. I've always I've got very good diagnostic skills and debugging skills, and I can read between the lines on things, and I pick up on a lot of nuances in terms of how people phrase things. It's like obviously with a forum, you can't really you're not face to face with someone, so you can't pick up their gestures and so forth. So I tend to try and look for that kind of stuff. The the thing that often frustrates me is that if you're posting a question about something that isn't working and you can't fix it, don't selectively cut and paste the stuff that you think is broken and hasn't been able to fix it with because that's probably not where it is. That you need to kind of provide enough kind of foundation and context to your question that it can be answered quickly. That, uh, that, that I can figure out what process are you using and I can figure out uh, kind of if you've enabled the clocks and some of the th kind of more obvious things that always make things break. Yeah. I mean, that's good advice because writing out all of that stuff sometimes helps you find the bug and then you don't even have to push submit. You can just go on and be done. It's nearly the same set of skills that you need as a tester to write good bug reports too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that I've always kind of, matched up with like being like a car mechanic it's like there's some pretty good car mechanics out there that are really good at figuring out from random descriptions people give them of noises and kind of how the accelerator or brakes respond that they can say yeah i know what that is it's, it's this thing and you'd think well you could make a really good software engineer because you actually understand the mechanics of things and i People always focus on, well, it's like computers or electronics or we need to do this in school and this kind of thing. And it's like, no, no, you don't need to you don't need to strip out classrooms and put computers in them. You really need to go to the fundamentals of kind of problem solving and kind of how to express problems in a way that people can solve them and how you can kind of think about problems and logical thinking. And I think that's really the skills that people need. They don't need to know how to, to Google things or use a word processor or use Excel. It's like it, those kind of things should be sufficiently evident if you understand the kind of mathematics and the, 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 the other aspects of things. It's understanding behavior not and, and sort of looking for patterns in behavior. Yeah, because these all these things are just kind of tools. But it's like if you don't know how you need to use the tools or fashion the thing, then 
the, the, the tools aren't that useful, that people use these, people use Excel as an editor for things and they do the wrong, <laughs> they use it for purposes that it was never, it should never have been designed to. Heck yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> don't look at me when you say that because yeah, I totally deserve it. Uh, so I, I agree with you. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of reading the manuals and really understanding the broad strokes or being able to, to get enough from things so that you know where to look. But that's a hard thing for people coming out of college or, or for makers who are got into it through Arduino and now want to know how to do it professionally. You mentioned uh, the U books, Joseph U, and I'll put some of the links to the Cortex ones in the show notes. Do you have other books you'd recommend? Uh, not, not so sure. I, I, for the ARM stuff, a lot of ARM stuff is really good. Um, on a historical basis, I think that, and, and things that still have have great deal of validity to them, a lot of the kind of Lance Leventhal and the Rodney Zacks books from the kind of late seventies and eighties, because they were they they were interfacing interfacing various bits of hardware and peripherals together and while that's all kind of gotten integrated now into kind of bigger ICs the 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 concepts really haven't changed a lot and the things and dealing with kind of memory and how memory functions so I guess I guess those would be kind of things that I'd say hey if you can if you can find those out on the internet it's like Go pick one of those up. It probably cost you three or four bucks, but it's like, and it's not a processor that you're using, but it's the thing that I grew up with, and it's 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 how I got the foundation to understand the kind of more complicated systems. And as I say, I think people today just have they're just they're just overwhelmed with information. There's just so much. It's like, where do I start? What should I look at? You know. And I, and I don't think the teaching necessarily helps some of this thing and, and how people are drawn into technology. You see people that see it as a kind of a, a well-paid career thing, and that's what they're focusing on. Whereas I kind of really came to this as like, yeah, this is really cool. I can do these things. I can, I can, I can make my own tools. I can make my own computers. I can do all these things. And I came to it from a very, from a very different place, I guess. Fair enough. Remember that Z80 book, the one that we never get rid of because yeah, that was a Lance Leventhal book. Ah, uh, okay. So I, I haven't found Rodney Sna- Sachs yet, but we will we will find some books and we will link them to the show notes. Yeah, they both have like a fantastic number of books. I think a lot of them are kind of replication of each other in many respects because they they deal with the kind of foundational stuff of kind of bits and bytes and registers and and so forth. And there's over the years, it's like there's more similarities in all this stuff than there are differences. It's like, yeah, you have to do slightly different assembler syntax or slightly different kind of uh, mnemonics for various different things. But at the heart, these things are all like little machines and they all tick in the same way. And it's like, if you, if you, if you understand that, you're ahead of the game. Rodney Zacks wrote Programming the 6502, which I'm is looking the other, right at it. Yeah, okay. Well, he he wrote 6502 books. He wrote Z80 books. Yeah. I, I grew up on the, the 6502 running a one megahertz with like 32K of RAM, I think it's the first system I had. And that was, that was pretty, good for, <laughs> pretty good for the time. But it's like, and then I went, I think I did some Z80. And I think my brother had an Atari ST with a 68,000. So I kind of did things with that and it was just a it was a great time for for doing that things back in the kind of early 80s and that's really where the kind of arm evolved from it's the 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 guys at arm or the guys at acorn at that point had basically dealt with all those available processes and they they basically cherry picked the 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 best the best concepts from all of them and came out with something that was really stellar and it it, it took a while to kind of percolate to the point where it's in every cell phone but it's it's still a hell of an achievement yes and these books are still interesting because if you wonder why it happens this way well because it made sense then and it carried forward because it still made sense. And you can look at something simpler to see why it got pushed that way. So those books are still useful. 
Yeah, and there's, I think there's ones on kind of interfacing peripherals and building little boards and stuff. There, there, there was a whole series that they did, and uh, I think Radio Shack had like variants of them and so forth. But it's like, yeah, that that, that stuff makes sense. And, and in terms of my perspective on the silicon, there's reasons that these things were done in certain ways because it was it's very efficient in terms of the, the transistors and the, the digital logic to do things certain ways. And it's like some of the ways that kind of humans interact with things are just illogical when it comes to, to computers. So a lot of the fundamentals are based on some pretty pretty kind of clear and simple rules about how to remove complexity. All right. I think we are about out of time. So I should ask you uh, if you have any final thoughts. Well, my final, uh, yeah, you asked me to, to think about this uh, initially. I think really it's, it's uh, if people want to participate in forums, it's like, don't just show up with your, your questions. It's like, don't just lurk. Join in and kind of add something to the conversation and, and try to help someone else and, and, and improve things. That is such a wonderful attitude and you embody it and I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. My guest has been Clive Turvey, ST Forums Guru and Senior Engineer at Janus Remote Communications. I'd like to offer a special thank you to Dennis Jackson for telling me I should stop whining about forums and do what he does, look for Clive's answers. He wrote, when you're reading through the posts on the ST Forums, anything written by Clive One is gold. <laughs> And thank you, as always, to Christopher White for co-hosting and producing and for searching for a new home for us. If we miss a show next week, which we might, I expect it will be because the realtor won't let us record a show during the open house. Clearly, she doesn't know how much this podcast would raise the sale price of our house. And thank you, of course, for listening. I have a final thought from J.M. Bari in Peter Pan. The fairies, as their custom, clapped their hands with delight over their cleverness, and they were so madly in love with the little house that they could not bear to think that they had finished it. <laughs> <laughs>